Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for another opportunity to look into your word, to have our thoughts refined by your truth. We pray again to be humbled by the truths of grace, these realities that recognize our utter hopelessness and helplessness apart from the gospel, our spiritual inability, inability to please you, inability to think straight, inability to do right, because of what we are naturally apart from grace. Lord, that nature has resulted in behavior that leaves us condemned forever unless you would intervene. And so we who are dead in transgressions and sins can say, but God who is rich in mercy. So we praise you even now for the grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the only way to be before you unstained, white as snow, not red and crimson and blood-stained as our sins deserve. Lord, thank you that you have given us a revelation of what you've done for us in the gospel, even in your word. Uh, we don't necessarily have a right to the internal details of Trinitarian plans to save sinners, and yet you've put these things on display because you are a God of mercy, a God of kindness, and your glory is to be seen and known and loved by the objects of your mercy, even in the understanding of how you've gone about saving sinners. So we rejoice in these things. We pray that you'd help us to see them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're looking again at the doctrines of grace. This is part four. So if you're keeping track by the five-petaled flower of a tulip, that's um, bad botany. But we're in uh, I, irresistible grace in the acronym uh, TULIP. And we'll call this the effectual call of God in the gospel. And what we mean by irresistible grace is simply that when God's grace comes into the life, it is a power to actually transform. Remember our three-word summary statement of the five points is simply this, God saves sinners. That is, from beginning to end, God does what it takes to bring spiritually dead guilty sinners into spiritual life, forgiven, adopted, justified. So it is really a remarkable thing and all of God that any of us believes. And none of us in this room who know Christ could say, hey, I woke up one day smarter than the next guy and figured out the gospel. Such things aren't possible from a spiritually dead state. Sinful man needs God's grace. This is why we say the refrain, salvation is of the Lord. It is from him and through him and to him. I want you to look first at Romans 6, 17. I didn't have this verse in my effectual call of the gospel passage list. I didn't have this in my irresistible grace topic list of Bible verses. I was just reading Romans this week and, and discovered the doctrine of irresistible grace sort of lurking everywhere. And I just want to highlight this for you to see it perhaps in an unexpected place. In Romans chapter 6, we have, of course, the remarkable chapter regarding the objective reality that believers have been set free from the dominion and tyranny of sin. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you are no longer a slave of sin. That is a declared reality. As Martin Lloyd-Jones said, it is objective outside of you, has nothing to do with how you feel. It is a reality purchased by the blood of Christ and secured by the effectual call. You are not a slave of sin. In this very chapter, notice what Paul says about this. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed, having been freed from sin, and you became slaves of righteousness. I want you to notice a couple of things in Romans 6, 17 that indicate the effectual call of God or the doctrine of irresistible grace in the gospel. Notice, first of all, Paul says, thanks thanks. Have you noticed that word thanks in your Bible in relationship to the spiritual condition of believers? Paul in his prayers often says, I thank God that you, and then talks about the belief of believers. 
If belief was something a spiritually dead, sinful human being from his own resources could conjure up, no thanks to God would be rendered. It would be inappropriate. But it is totally appropriate and totally consistent with the scripture's witness to give thanks to God for anybody that is saved, for anybody that believes. Why? Because God produces it. And Paul does that thing right here. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, again, under that condition of tyranny of sin with no other choice but to obey sin, you actually became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. It's important in this chapter because no slave could get himself out from under an irremovable slavery. And yet God in the gospel does that very thing. Why did believers come out from the tyranny of the slavery of sin and become obedient from the heart? Because God did something. God saved. God removed you, according to the wording of Romans 5.21, from the reign of sin, and God put you under a new tyranny, a good one, the kingship, the reign, the dominion of grace. And this grace is said to be irresistible because God set out to do something and he actually accomplished it. It's why Paul says, thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient. I thank God that you became obedient. This is all of God's work. And you became obedient to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Uh, That's a divine passive. In other words, someone's doing the committing. God's doing the committing here. This doctrine of irresistible grace or this doctrine of the effectual call of God truly is the outworking of the doctrine of regeneration. We'll get to later in our time this morning. When God new births someone, with regeneration come all that is required for entrance into the Christian life. Irresistible grace or the effectual call of God unto salvation is the effective work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate, to give spiritual life to the dead sinner, and thereby to give a new nature from which spring faith and repentance. Without this work of the Holy Spirit, the sinner would remain dead in transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2.1, unable to respond to the universal invitation of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man would still be merely man, not spiritual. Simply stated, this doctrine asserts that the Holy Spirit never fails to bring to salvation those sinners whom he personally calls to Christ. He inevitably applies salvation to every sinner whom he intends to save, and it is his intention to save the elect. I'll read a little bit from our doctrinal statement regarding this doctrine of irresistible grace or the Spirit's regenerating grace and power. The Father works in salvation to sovereignly and graciously elect sinners out of his wrath for salvation. The Son, Jesus Christ, came to earth to make atonement for the sin of the Father's elect. What about the third member of the Godhead? The Holy Spirit's primary ministry in the salvation of man is to negate the effects of past, present, and future sinful offenses of the redeemed by the cross of Jesus. The Holy Spirit must come to the sinner and recreate him at the heart level so that he will be inclined or oriented toward God rather than toward sin. He, the Holy Spirit, must overcome depravity and the inability of the sinner. Regeneration makes salvation possible for the sinner by enabling him to make use of two crucial gifts from God, faith and repentance, which the Holy Spirit uses to apply the effects of the cross of Christ. Now, it's important for us to differentiate between the effectual call, the effectual call unto salvation by God in the gospel. That's what we're talking about this morning, irresistible grace to differentiate that effectual call from what we would call the general call of the gospel. The general call of the gospel is the universal invitation to believe. It goes out rightly to everybody. Preach the gospel to every living creature. The effectual call of God in the gospel is the Holy Spirit's internal work to bring about a turn from sin unto God. Matthew 22 verse 14 is a good example of the general call. Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. 
There, clearly, the ones chosen unto salvation is a smaller group than the ones called. This is a general, universal call of salvation. It is right to call everybody to salvation in Christ. Listen to the invitations, a couple invitations from the Old Testament. I'll read to you from Isaiah chapter 1. Again, all of these uh, references that I'll be reading this morning and referring to, they're all in the notes. If you'd like a copy of the notes, just send me a text or an email. I'd be happy to send you a copy. Isaiah 1.18. Listen to God's invitation. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. And listen to this invitation in Isaiah 55. This invitation, I I would summarize as the great promise of the Bible. God says, yo, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, says Yahweh, and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. This is God's gracious invitation to an obstinate people. Not everybody heeds that invitation. That is a general call of God to salvation. Now, the word that is used most often to describe a call, it is used both of a general call a handful of times, and then the effectual call overwhelmingly in the New Testament is the Greek word kaleo. It's used 148 times in the New Testament, 29 times by Paul. Every time by Paul, uh, it has to do with the effectual call of salvation. And almost every time it's used in the New Testament, even outside of Paul, it results in the actual salvation of a believer. That is simply the way the word overwhelmingly is used. It is appropriate then to call this an effective calling or an effectual call unto salvation. Wayne Grudem says it this way, when God calls people in this powerful way, he calls them out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2.9. He calls them into the fellowship of his son, 1 Corinthians 1.9, and into his own kingdom and glory, 1 Thessalonians 2.12. People who have been called by God belong to Jesus Christ, Romans 1.6. They are called to be saints, 1 Corinthians 1.2, and they have come into the realm of peace, 1 Corinthians 7.15. They've come into a realm of freedom, Galatians 5.13, and hope, Ephesians 1.8. Holiness, 1 Thessalonians 4.7. Patient endurance of suffering, 1 Peter 2.20, and eternal life, 1 Timothy 6.12. That is the destination of this word calling. These verses indicate that no powerless, merely human calling is in view. This calling is rather a kind of summons from the king of the universe, and it has such power that it brings about the response that it asks for in people's hearts. According to Wayne Grudem, this is an act of God that guarantees a response. This is what we mean by irresistible grace. Are there people that resist God's grace? Yes, certainly. Are there people that resist a general call and invitation to the gospel? Yes, most certainly. But when we talk about irresistible grace, what we're talking about is the biblical doctrine of the effectual call of God, that when God does a supernatural work in the heart, it works. It accomplishes what God sets out to do. There's a long list of passages in the notes Uh, that demonstrate irresistible grace, I'll just highlight a few of those for you. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. What's remarkable about Deuteronomy 30 and the promise that God would circumcise hearts, this is a new covenant promise all the way back before Israel is even in the land for the first time. And it follows Deuteronomy 10 where God makes the assertion that the heavens and the highest heavens belong to him, implication, how much more should your puny little heart and mind and life belong to him? Everything belongs to him in the universe. Therefore, circumcise your hearts, O Israel. 
There is a command, a general universal command, one that is right. It is appropriate for God to demand that his sinful, rebellious creatures have soft hearts toward them. God actually demands of them something they cannot produce, and it is a right and appropriate command. Some people have protested the doctrine of irresistible grace because they say, how could God demand something that's impossible to do? That's not fair. What's not fair is us rebellious creatures not rendering the glory due to God's name. Us creatures not behaving as if God is the creator and sustainer and as if we don't owe him everything. That's what's not fair. For God to demand the impossible of us is not unreasonable of him. It's a very reasonable request. By the way, he does this all the time. God said, Uh, when when he was on the earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to a man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand. Jesus gave an impossible command. Along with the impossible command, in the very words of Jesus, was the power to obey the command. Jesus told the lame man to walk, and he jumped. Jesus told Lazarus to walk out of his own tomb. And a dead man obeyed. This is what God has done from the beginning. Remember, God is the one who said, let light shine out of darkness. God commanded light be, and light that didn't even exist obeyed him by coming into existence. God works the impossible. It's not an unreasonable command for God to say, soften your hearts before me. And then that very reasonable command for an impossible obedience is followed up by the promise in Deuteronomy 30, I will circumcise your hearts. God does the impossible work that he demands. Ezekiel 36, God promises, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That is God's new covenant promise to Israel about regeneration in the heart by his spirit. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, but you have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, this was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Who is it that understands the sayings of Jesus that are mysteries to the unregenerate? Those who are born again by the Spirit, called here in this verse, those whom the Son wills to reveal them. Listen to John 1. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. You see, there it is, belief. That's a human activity. Yes, verse 13. Who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. You see, when you believed the gospel, you made a decision that involved your will and your affections. Perhaps you went from thinking that Jesus was utterly boring to thinking he was the greatest person ever. Maybe you went from thinking that you didn't want somebody to tell you what to do to all of a sudden joyfully submitting to the Lordship of Christ. Everything turned, and it involved your will. We've talked about this already in this series. God did not go around the human will nor around the human affections to bring someone to Christ, but straight through them. He overhauls them. And he overhauls them not by the will of man, but by new birth. This is all of grace. This is all of God. John 3.27, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. That includes faith. A will to worship him, a desire for him, repentance. John 4, 23, the father seeks worshipers. John 5, 21, just as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he wishes. John 6, 37, all that the father gives me will come to me, says Jesus, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. There's an unbreakable chain there between those whom the Father has given, those whom the Son draws, and those whom the Son keeps. Acts 2.39, Peter's sermon 
The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Who is the promise for? Those whom God calls to himself. Again, an effectual call by God. Acts 5.31. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Notice what's granted. That's one of those grace words. It's a gift. Repentance and forgiveness. Uh, Those aren't mustered up by some natural process in the heart of an unregenerate man. Those are gifts from God. Supernatural. Acts 11, 18, at the report that Gentiles had believed, they glorified God and they said, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Again, repentance is a supernatural grace gift in the gospel. Acts 13, 48 says, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. It is true that when you believed, you decided to follow Jesus, but there's a question back of that. There's a question behind it. Why did you believe? Why did you decide to follow Jesus? Why was your will overhauled and your affections overturned? Because God drew. God called you to himself. Acts 16, 14, a woman named Lydia of the city of Thyatira, seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God. She was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Here outside of Philippi at a river, there weren't enough people for a synagogue. An Old Testament Gentile style God fearer, that is a Gentile who had attached herself to the God of Israel, still didn't know the gospel, hadn't yet believed. And at the preaching of the gospel, the Lord opened her heart to believe the things that were being said. Listen to the testimony of Romans 8.30. These whom God predestined, he also, you know it, called. There's our kaleo, the effectual calling of God, that word that happens 148 times in the New Testament. And it is the ones who are predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son who are the same ones as those called. And the verse goes on, all those whom he called, he also justified. All whom he justified, he also glorified. Future reality in a past tense verb because it's as good as done. This is an unbreakable chain of salvation. Who are the glorified? Every single one of the justified. Nobody fell through the cracks. Who are the justified? Every single one of the called. Nobody fell through the cracks. Who are the called? Every single one of the predestined. Nobody fell through the cracks. Who are the predestined? Every single one of the foreknown. That is foreloved in relational intimacy by God before time began. All of these things go together. Romans 9, 23. God did this to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not from among Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. That is the called in Romans 9 are the ones God desired to make his mercy known by making them prepared for glory. 1 Corinthians 12.3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. 2 Thessalonians 2.14, it was for this that he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. James 1.18, in the exercises of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a first fruits among his creatures. In the exercise of whose will? In the exercise of God's will, he brought us forth. 1 Peter 1.15, but like the Holy One who called you, be you holy yourselves in all of your behavior. 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Turn to Acts 7.51. There are an overwhelming number of texts indicating this doctrine of irresistible grace or the effectual call of God. What do we make of Acts 7.51? At the apex of Stephen's sermon, 
to a crowd of unbelieving Jews and Jewish leaders, he makes this declaration. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, just as your fathers did. Is that a, a proof text against irresistible grace? Here we have this statement there, resisting the Holy Spirit. No, of course, this verse needs to sing. The Holy Spirit can be resisted. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. Who is it that rejects, resists, stiff arms the Holy Spirit's uh, message? The uncircumcised, the heart of heart. Those who are stopped up of ears and blind spiritually. What overcomes that resistance? Some act of human will? No, everything we just read. The Holy Spirit himself is the agent who can overcome resistance to the Holy Spirit. Nobody could do that but him. Acts 7.51 does not deny irresistible grace. Irresistible grace simply means that for some, that is, the ones whom Jesus purchased with his own blood, the ones whom the Father elected before time to be predestined to conform to the image of his Son, are actually called by the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to overcome their hard-heartedness. This is the same message as the Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy 30 message. Circumcise your hearts. Reasonable command. Impossible to obey. I will circumcise your hearts. God does the impossible. It is the uncircumcised of heart that resists the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that circumcises the hearts and undoes the resistance. What is the significance of the doctrine of the effectual call on evangelism? Have you ever thought about the connection between irresistible grace and evangelism? If you're to preach the gospel and man was totally free not a slave of sin, totally indifferent in his thoughts and his abilities. The noetic effects of sin didn't exist, and man just was a blank slate morally, intellectually neutral, not biased against God from the heart. And, and all you had to do was convince somebody at the intellectual level, at the logical level, uh, at the level of appeal, at the level of emotional response, that Jesus was the best way to go. In other words, if salvation were in the hands of the skill of the evangelist, what should we be doing? <laughs> Coming up with every trick, every contrivance, every argument, every man-made sales technique that we could come up with to get somebody in to a decision for Christ. This was Finney's new measures. He believed that man was in the driver's seat of his spiritual condition, that man had the ability to make a fundamental change in his internal capacity for God. And so he invented all kinds of new devices whereby people could be pressured, tacticked into a decision for Christ. He believed that conversion was all about a decision that was made. So he created the anxious bench. And maybe we should have one of these. It was a, you know, a small uh, pew up front by the preacher. And he would call somebody out by name and make them sit up there in front of everybody else and harangue them until they relented. Hellfire and brimstone and guilt and everything else. And you're not leaving this bench until you make a decision for Christ. And they would. And he had a lot of other strategies like that to get people to make decisions. And at the end of his life, I'm not convinced Finney was a believer. His testimony is really squirrely. At the end of his life, he said, it seems like it was my tragic lot in life to bring about tens of thousands of spurious conversions. That is, people who under the high pressure sales tactics made a decision for Christ, but were not born again and walked away from Christ. If Finney was one of the preachers during the so-called Second Great Awakening, in which there were some good preachers, and many like Finney, who believed salvation was about a decision that man could make. And so they used all the sales tactics to bring about people 
unconverted into a decision for Christ that was short-lived. In fact, the American Midwest uh, became known as the burned over district as a result. Lots of people could say, oh, I went to that tent revival thing. I heard the preacher. I heard about Jesus. Been there, done that. No, thank you. And a whole swath of the American population became inoculated to the gospel. Hard-hearted, resistant, as a result of that kind of preaching. What is the truth about evangelism and irresistible grace? You and I boldly proclaim the gospel to everything that moves. Tell everybody you know, everybody you meet, how great your Savior is. And Jesus will draw people to himself. Rather than just a, a, a possibility that somebody might get saved if I say it the right way and they make the right decision at the right time. No, the reality is there are blood-bought saints that will get saved through the means of preaching the gospel of Jesus' faithful servants because Jesus himself uses means to draw people to himself. Many of the missionaries that came out of the great missionary movement, William Carey, the father of modern missions, and many of those who came out of Edinburgh and the great Scottish revivals, went to the ends of the earth and said things like, I could not do missions if God were not sovereign. And that's the truth. If evangelism depended on your ability, oh, woe is us. Preach the gospel in a graveyard and see what happens. Nothing. And yet, with gospel proclamation comes this effectual call of God unto salvation, where the Spirit opens hearts, and God draws people to himself, and the Son gives them life. That's a reality we can bank on in evangelism. Most often, the argument against this doctrine is an elevation of free will, human ability, a denial of the doctrine of total depravity. Um, if you're curious about that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the first session. Theologians talk about the order of salvation. They'll use a phrase called the ordo salutis. Uh, that is simply a reference to what comes first in the operating principles of what happens in salvation. Is this an important question? Uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Does it really matter? Uh, maybe, um, maybe it matters in Genesis, which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> but is this, a, is this one of those theological questions that, that theologians like to debate about, or does it have some importance? And maybe where it's most critical comes the question, does regeneration precede faith? Right? Is, is new birth the result of belief, or is belief the result of new birth? Um, that, that can be an important question. Really, we're asking about a causal relationship. Are we regenerate because we believe, or do we believe because we are regenerate? And, and just to clarify up front, there are no regenerate people who do not believe. But there's, there's not really a gap between regeneration and faith in terms of actuality, because you can't have a regenerate person that doesn't believe, and there's nobody who believes that's not regenerate. And I mean by that belief in a saving way, right? You read the gospel of John, there are plenty of people who believe, are said to believe in the gospel of John, who turn away, that is spurious belief. But when we're talking about belief that saves, that always goes hand in glove with regeneration, so if any space can be put between regeneration and faith in a temporal sense, it has no effect. It has no real consequence in an eternal sense. In short, a regenerate person genuinely believes, and a genuine believer is regenerate. However, there are some important realities for us to consider. Faith is an instrumental condition of justification, uh, people believe and are justified. And there are some passages in your notes to that effect if you'd like to look those up. Faith and repentance are tied together. Acts 20, 21 and 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 both indicate that faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. And faith and repentance are seen as gifts. Faith specifically is seen as the consequence of new birth. Uh, look at 1 John 5. 
Again, there are a number of texts that indicate this. But 1 John 5.1 is an interesting way to say this. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That is, has been begotten of God. Stands in a born again state. It's an interesting indication of faith as a consequence of new birth. And it's important to see some grammatical constructions in the relationships between new birth and salvation realities. Stay in 1 John and look at 1 John 2.29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteous, righteousness is born of him. That is, practicing righteousness is a fruit of new birth. 1 John 4, 7 indicates that love is the result of new birth. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves God is born of God and knows God. And it certainly wouldn't be right to say anyone who loves God therefore gets born again, right? Do you see the causal relationship? Love for God comes out of new birth, not the other way around. Righteousness comes out of new birth, not the other way around. Overcoming the world is also given this same relationship. 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born again, uh, or excuse me, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's an interesting statement. You don't become an overcomer and then get born again. As if overcoming or practicing righteousness or loving others qualifies you for new birth. No, new birth produces all of these things. So when John says in 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, that same grammatical relationship is working to demonstrate that new birth is the root of faith, not the fruit of it. All of these realities spring from regeneration rather than being the cause of regeneration. So if we summarize the ordo salutis or the order of salvation, we would put it this way. Number one, foreknowledge. That is, foreloved. God, before time, uh, planned a relationship, a personal relationship with people whom he wanted to save. Number two, the effectual call, regeneration. Number three, conversion. That is, faith and repentance. And then justification and adoption and sanctification and perseverance and glorification. And the key part for all of this in the doctrine of irresistible grace is seeing regeneration preceding Faith. And think about this. If faith and repentance, uh, that is conversion, turning from worthless idols to the true and living God, turning from sin to Christ, turning from my old life to a new life, if all of that is a gift of God, 1 Timothy 2, 8, 9 says the whole package is a grace gift of God. If all of that is a work of the Spirit, Acts eleven eighteen, 18, then it is easy to see how faith must be the result of regeneration and not the other way around. However, if faith is a decision of man according to his own ability, then it wouldn't be necessary to see regeneration as preceding faith. And you see, all of this goes back to an errant doctrine of total depravity and spiritual inability. Let's talk about regeneration for a moment. Regeneration is the word for new birth. You must be born again. Again, Jesus uh, in John 1.12, or John records in John 1.12, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. This is a critical description of what it means to be a Christian. You didn't have what it takes the way you were born the first time. You must be born anew, born again, born from above, born of God. You're not qualified naturally to be in God's presence. We would only justly deserve his condemnation. Man must be born again. This was Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John 3. It, the result, I mean, it is the, the need demonstrated by the condition outlined in Ephesians 2.1. Humans are spiritually dead from birth. 
Total depravity includes the hopeless condition of spiritual inability, the inability of understanding, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the inability of spiritual sight, 2 Corinthians 4.4, the inability of spiritual hearing, Jeremiah 6.10, and the hard, uncircumcised condition of the heart, Deuteronomy 10 and Jeremiah 17. The agent of new birth is the Holy Spirit, John 6.63 and 2 Corinthians 3.6. And the language of new birth is interesting. The, the word again um, it has the idea of being born from a place, being born uh, in the context of the gospel of John from above. The regeneration is a word that occurs twice in the New Testament, describing a state of being renewed, uh, the experience of a complete change of life or rebirth. And the word specific to be born again, to beget again, to cause to be born again is used of this new life in Christ. We have been born again to a living hope, Peter said. And we have been born again, not of perishable seed. <clears throat> to be born of God is another critical phrase uh, used uh, at least six times in John's writing. That is the source of new birth is totally of him. Sometimes our world uses the phrase new birth as sort of a remaking of oneself. I needed a reset. I needed a start over in life. That is borrowed. They borrowed terminology from the Bible that has nothing to do with what you can do for yourself. In the Bible, this idea of new birth has to do with only that which God could accomplish. It's why greeting somebody on their birthday and thanking them for being born is really an effective evangelistic tool. Thanks for being born. You're welcome. Uh, no, wait, I, I didn't have much to do with that. And if you're speaking to a believer to follow that up with, yeah, and thanks for being born again. Yeah, I didn't have much to do with that either. And I think that's the point of the illustration Jesus intends with the idea that you must be born again. Regeneration overcomes spiritual deadness and inability. Regeneration precedes faith and is the ground of new desires, a new will, new capacities, new affections. The one who is born again is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, with a new identity, John 1, 12, with new loves, 1 John 4, 7, new behavior, 1 John 5, 18, and a new destiny, 1 John 5, 4. That is all the work of God in the heart. Have you ever heard somebody ask, can a Christian do fill in the blank and still go to heaven? Have you heard that? It's an attempt to try to ask, boy, could I, could I sin in a certain grievous way and not be forever disqualified? Maybe you've known somebody who's walked with Christ and then sinned in some grievous way. And you've asked the question, man, are they a Christian? Can a Christian even do this? I think the question is probably most often asked after a suicide. Can a Christian take his own life? I mean, that's, that's murder. That's the height of pride and self-will and a lack of love for everybody else involved. Those things are true. And I'm, I don't want to answer that question directly this morning. That's not the intent of this lecture. But I will say it misses the point of the qualification for heaven. The, the real question behind all of these is not, can a person do such and such a thing and still go to heaven? Only if one is born again can one see the kingdom of God. The real question is, is so and so regenerate? And then the Bible will help us investigate that most important question. Is there evidence of new birth? Faith in Jesus Christ, fundamental change from the inside out. Are there new desires, new behaviors, lasting fruit, love for God, love for others, a personal identity and experience of sonship to God? All of those things become important questions. But the bottom line fundamental question is, are you born again? Born from above, born of God. There are related terms to this idea of new birth. Galatians 4.29 speaks of those born according to the Spirit. Titus 3.5 speaks of those who are washed and renewed by the Holy Spirit. In Colossians 2.13, God made you alive. Gives a similar idea. Related to all of this is the doctrine of repentance. Let's just think through repentance uh, for a moment. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark 
Mark 1 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. There's good news. Good news from Christ. Good news from his messengers. The king is returning. Eternal life is available. And what is required for entrance into Christ's kingdom? Faith and repentance. Do you see them tied together there? Repent and believe. That is, there is a turning from something and a turning to something else and belief in the gospel. Repentance at its uh, very word means a change of mind resulting in a change of behavior. It is a turning from one thing internally to another with a concomitant uh, result in outward living. This is the call of gospel preaching. In the Old Testament, repentance was most often represented by a single word to turn or to return. This is found in Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him turn or return to the Lord. That is a call to turn from one thing to another. And the Bible is rich in idioms describing man's responsibility in the process of repentance. Such phrases would include the following. Incline your heart unto the Lord your God, Joshua 24, 23. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, Jeremiah 4, 4. Wash your heart from wickedness, Jeremiah 4, 14. Break up the fallow ground of your heart, Hosea 10, 12. All of these expressions of man's <clears throat> penitential activity are subsumed and summarized under this one verb to turn. Better than any other word in the Old Testament, it combines in itself the two ideas of repentance, turning from evil and turning unto God, or turning unto that which is right. In the New Testament, repentance is conveyed by three words, and, and all of these uh, have the idea of a change of mind. The first half to, has to do simply with regrets about something, a wish that something could be undone. Matthew 21, 29 uses this word. It is an emotional component in repentance. It is the lament over things that have uh, not been right. It is regret. And that word is not always accompanied by real repentance. You can regret and lament without truly repenting. But the common word to repent, the verb form metanoeo and the noun form metanoia, is a change of mind with a result in a change of behavior. And this word occurs throughout the New Testament. Repentance describes the initial turning of God unto salvation, Acts 20, 21. You can't be a Christian without it. Although in my undergraduate degree at a, a very well-known Bible Institute, I was taught that repentance has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, that was a part of the gospel I had to unlearn uh, after I left college. But repentance also describes not just the entrance into gospel life, but also the appropriate ongoing response to sin in the life of a believer. 2 Corinthians 7 details what this looks like. Being made sorrowful, but being made sorrowful to the point of repentance, according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything. The sorrow, according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. The sorrow of the world, by contrast, produces death. Behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, fear, longing, zeal, avenging of wrong, in anything you demonstrate yourselves to be innocent in the matter." That is the description of ongoing repentance in the Christian life. If you think back to Martin Luther's 95 Theses, the very first one indicates that repentance must be the characterization, the ongoing reality of the Christian life. Repentance, as we have seen already, is not something sinful, unregenerate man can gin up by his own strength. It's not something that comes natural. That is the sorrow of the world. But the kind of repentance that pleases the Lord is the kind that comes by the work of the Holy Spirit as a gift. The word conversion is a word we find in the Bible as well. It is a turning of the human will toward God. Repentance of faith are two sides of that same coin. 
Repentance is the turning away from godliness. Faith positively is belief and entrusting oneself to God. And conversion describes repentance and faith together. Acts 15, 3, therefore being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. And it was bringing great joy to all the believers. I want to close this morning by thinking about just broadly the unbreakable chain of salvation. Uh, As as far as I know, this is a, a coin termed, coin termed, I don't know what that is. A term coined by one of my theology professors. He may have gotten it from somewhere else, but I got it from him. Trevor Cragen describes a number of New Testament texts that link the past, the present, and the future of the soteriological events in in what he called the unbreakable chain of salvation. And I want you to listen as I read a few passages for the following links in the chain. Number one, the manner in which these events are linked and cannot be pulled apart. Number two, the way in which eternity future is determined by what happens in time. Number three, the divine initiative originating in eternity past. The direction that soteriological events are headed. And lastly, the impact on the present of past and future events. I know that was a mouthful. It's all in the notes. All of these things are linked together past present, and future. Listen to John 3.16. For God in this manner loved the world, past event, that he gave his only begotten son, past event, that all the believing ones in him, present reality, shall not perish, absolute certain reality, but absolutely will possess eternal life. A locked in future for those presently experiencing belief based on what God has done in his love in the past. An unbreakable chain. A a, a definiteness in God's plan of salvation from before time to beyond time. Romans 5, 1 to 11 is another one of those unbreakable chains. I'll let you read that. Listen again to Romans 8, 29 to 30. Those whom God foreknew, past event. He also predestined, past event, to become conformed to the image of his son, so that his son would be the preeminent one among many brethren. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Another past event for any who are believers. It would be a present reality if you're being effectually called even this moment, and a future reality for those who are elect but don't yet believe. And all those whom he called, he also justified. A past tense, objective reality for everyone who is in Christ. And all whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, in this unbreakable chain of salvation, nobody falls through the cracks. From foreknown, to predestined, to called, to justified, to glorified. Grammatically, it's impossible for anybody to fall out of the chain. Ephesians 1, 3 to 12 is another long chain. Um, I'll go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is God's destining activity in the past, salvation in the future. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, past realities in God's plan, present realities in your faith and repentance, and the future guarantee of glory. We will stop there. Pick up the last pedal of the tulip next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for immeasurable love, unspeakable kindness, your unbelievable grace through the gospel to all who will believe. God, I pray that you would make us rabid evangelists, taking the good news of your son 
his atoning death and his coming kingdom to everything that moves, to every creature under the sun. And would you be pleased to draw people to yourself through these efforts? We acknowledge, God, that if you did not call people to yourself by the power of your Holy Spirit, all would be left dead. Evangelism would be fruitless. Our labors would be empty. But we know that you have purchased for yourself a people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And you have asked us to go to the ends of the earth to proclaim your son. And so we go with the confidence of the guarantee that you will get your own. And so we pray, even as those who have gone to mission fields before us, we ask that the lamb would indeed receive the reward of his suffering. To him be all glory. Amen.